Hello everybody, James here, WSI, my next guest. Some, in fact, may say that my next guest is the greatest bad guy in the history of the business. And with the company he was keeping in the 1980s, that was no mean feat to achieve such a thing. Holder of nearly every single NWA championship that matters, as well as a WWE and NWA Hall of Famer, Tully Blanchard. Welcome. James, it's a thrill to be here with you. And... Let's get to some of these questions that you got asked. Yeah, I, I sort of teed you up beforehand that we had uh, 200 people, 200 questions writing in. And uh, as I say, I managed to pare it down to about 10 pages worth. So if you're ready for it, the first one is, in fact, I've actually not got two questions. I've got just two things that are nice that people wrote in. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. M, the greatest heel ever, Tully Blanchard, assassin number one is second, which I thought was uh, quite an interesting sort of one-two combo of the best bad guys in the business. And Crescent NJD says, huge Tully Blanchard fan. Not going to leave a question because it won't be asked, but Tully just wants to say, huge fan, true legend, and you never get your due. Well, I, that's an honor that people would think that. Um, the only thing that you can do is back when I was in the business, is go out every day and every night and do the very, very best that you could do to entertain the people that paid to come and watch your little part of the, the big scheme of the show that night. And I am uh, very humbled and very honored that people consider me even in a breath of being one of the best or the best bad guy in wrestling because it was um it was 24 7 it was all day i thought about wrestling all the time uh long car trips at night you know what what can i do different what can i do to uh, uh, generate that emotion inside of a uh, wrestling fan so that they could cheer when I got beat up. Mm. And uh, it is, and I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know that that's still the same mindset uh, in wrestling. I, I, too many people, all they want to do is do their spots rather than make people scream. And uh, the some of my best matches, I got beat up 90% of the time. And uh, people screamed for 90% of the match. So uh, anyway, I hope that was a long-winded answer. You could you can do as long-winded an answer as you want to give. Don't you worry <laughs> about that. Do you know, uh, someone actually wrote this later on, but I think this is a good time to ask it now, is everyone loves a Mount Rushmore. Uh, taking yourself out of the equation come up with the four best bad guys heels in the history of the business, according to you, as far as influence and just you enjoying their work. Oh, I know, I know that's quite a big question to ask at this time in the morning. So I apologize. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big question, but I mean, the people that I learned from, okay were Luthez, uh, Dory and Terry Funk, Harley Race, Nick Bockwinkle. And when, when Nick would come and wrestle in San Antonio for a week, he'd stay with me and we'd stay up half the night talking theory, talking ideas, talking do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. This generates that kind of a response. Uh, and it was uh, uh, those kind of guys are the guys that that I went and said, okay, these are the these are the biggest names in wrestling. They draw more money. they're they've made it to the top. They're world champions. What do they have that I need? And 
So that that's kind of my if you can use that as a as a go to. Th- those are the people that that I got influence from and uh, uh, designed my my performance. Who was the first? Uh, I, I was. I always end up using the wrestling vernacular, but I always try not to. Who was the first, let's say, superstar bad guy that you wrestled that you, on a really hands-on role, taught you how to become a bad guy yourself? Um, I was probably the 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 biggest benefit to my career was the three years the three summers that I refereed and I refereed six matches a night on Wednesday and six matches a night on, on uh, Thursday. And I got to referee matches with Jose Lothario uh, and Terry Funk, Dory Funk, uh, Mil Mascaras. um, And, you were put in a position to feel the audience responses to what you were watching as a referee and trying to make it look like you were doing something. And those kinds of situations, uh, Wahoo McDaniels, Johnny Valentine, uh, when, when John was after the plane crash and he was paralyzed, my dad used him as a manager and uh, gosh, his, his critique uh, of me refereeing and then me wrestling. uh, And it was, it was just phenomenal. But the thing that, that, uh, and, and I don't really know why I, I suggested it, but I suggested to Wahoo because he was our booker and to my dad. I said, look, I said, I, I, I'm a mediocre baby face. I said, I think that I can be a great heel. Uh, and so with a lot of discussion with my dad, because promoters kids were not heels and uh and so when i switched to be a heel i mean it it was a we had a tag team tournament for the southwest championship wrestling title and i mean it was a very simple little thing we ended up uh with a babyface match in the finals uh, Alberto Madrill and and myself, and we had a very good uh, wrestling match. And the finish was uh, leapfrog and and accidentally hit Alberto in the groin, and he was down and out. And rather than doing the babyface thing. Oh no, I can't accept anything, whatever. Da, da, da. I said, no, he can't wrestle. Give me the title. <laughs> and I walked out with the championship and, uh, you know, and, and that was, that was not even a big monster thing, but just an attitude thing. And so it, that, that is the first, that's when I stepped across into the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> and he never left. <laughs> I've uh, never left. You're right. I'm going to. I hate to say this because, as I say, you know, there's so much we could be talking about, and you know, we'd have like a an almanac of of, of shows if we did everything in your career. So we'll have to just do some of the uh, big hits for now. Uh, e Armstrong asks: When you were tagging with Gino Hernandez, did Gino show the star quality at that time, like he had in World Class, or was he still green? No, Gino was was not. He was he was very very uh, talented, and when he and I were a tag team, it was very very uh, very good. And uh, actually, when I when I first in 1984, when I first started uh, back with Crockett, uh, 
we at, we called Gino on the phone and asked him if he would come and and go to work for us, and he didn't because uh, he was locked into where he was with world class. And uh, I, I don't know that I think it was maybe a year or so more after that. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly when he died, but it wasn't too long after that. Do you think he would have made it into the Horseman, or would he just have had another spot on the card if he'd gone to Crockett? <clears throat> well, that was way before the Horseman. So, I mean, I don't know that we would have been, if he would have been there, I don't know that they would have tried to team he and I. I don't know if that would have been part of the Horseman because the Anderson name was uh, Gene and Ole were so over in the Carolinas. And then when when Arn came in as their nephew, they were over instantaneously. Um, and then they had Flair was a cousin is, is what was, was said. So, uh, the only way I got put into that group was because I was wrestling dusty at the time and he was the booker. So, uh, thankfully for that. So if Gino would have been there, I don't think that that would have been the mesh. Um, but, uh, I'm very, very thankful that, that, uh, we, were put together like that. The the thing that everybody really doesn't sometimes understand, at least I think they don't understand, the this was not Crockett and the the brain trusts sitting back and said, oh, we need to call these four guys the four horsemen. This was an eight-man tag match that interviews were just flowing and Arn just called us the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And that somehow caught on and wrestling fans started having signs and four horsemen thing. And I can remember standing in, in the dressing room, watching the, the preliminary matches in the Greensboro Coliseum and Jim Crockett, told whispered in my ear he said this thing's getting over and i said you think <laughs> and then they started pouring the the gas to it and it, it just it just exploded but the thing that that was was so powerful was even at the start of it you had arn was a tag team and then rick and i were the singles and then when when Ole left, it was, you know, how, how do you substitute somebody in there? And uh, they had just hired Luger, so they put him in there. That was not really a, a, a great mix, so that was short-lived. Um, but the, the, the powerful change when Barry – switched and became heel and became one of us then you had four performers that could really perform with anybody and it was it was just very dynamic and the the thing that the, the shift inside was Barry became the other single and then I became Arn's partner and and so that's you know how all that worked and uh but it was you know, I mean, we could we could all go separately. We could all go uh, wrestle one on one. It didn't have to be the group all the time, even though we were part of the group. I'm uh, unsurprisingly a lot of people wrote in horseman questions. I'll get to quite a lot of them as much as we can a little later. Just before we move off Southwest, who owns the Southwest Library now? Not a clue. Really? I thought it would either be... Did you have any idea that you could sell it to Vince or...? Ah, it was... I think my dad sold it to somebody. I, I do not know. Um, that was in a, in a very, very uh, down part of our lives because my brother had just gotten killed um, in 1978. And uh, 
it was uh, just catastrophic. And uh, our, our territory was good, then it was bad, and without getting into a whole lot of extracurricular gaga and people that uh, said things and were bad partners and bad uh, this, the, the wrestling business still is the television business. And if you had good TV time, people would come to your arenas. And even though TV is the product now, rather than the arena shows, if you got if you got ratings, people will still come to the arenas. Hmm. And uh, that is the thing that we needed. And when our, when our partner uh, took our TV time in San Antonio and Corpus and all around and gave it to uh to world class it killed our business and uh we couldn't pay for the usa cable uh outlet anymore and so uh when when our bill got to be high enough uh vince went in and paid our bill and took the tv time and so vince actually because <laughs> That was going to, that was actually going to be my follow-up question is so uh, before I actually get to the follow-up question how did your dad get onto cable in the first place because he's one of the very first before Vince who made it onto cable and uh, was seen nationally at the time yes um he and I, I wasn't I wasn't there quite uh all the time in those negotiations but um when the usa cable network started uh they we had somebody we had a, a tv marketer that uh reached out to them and and uh i mean it wasn't it wasn't usa saying hey come be on our our network it was uh hey we'll sell you an hour of tv time it's almost and, like advertising they sort of worked it like you were um T not telemarketing, but what was the uh, late night advertising kind of thing? Yeah, but our, our thing was on at uh, uh, Sunday at twelve noon. Oh, and that's that's what we tried to to be because people, uh, you were either in church or watching wrestling, <laughs> and, and it was uh, a thing that that we had uh, we had great ratings, but we could only pay the seven thousand a week for a while and when that got to be too heavy to where we couldn't run the territory anymore that's when things really started to fall apart man that's huge seven thousand a week as well in those days crikey um yeah. were, were you in an ironclad contract as well so you couldn't just say look we can't afford this anymore were you uh, under contract you had to pay it essentially um well we ended up owing them like a hundred and 20 30 40 thousand I wasn't really in that part of everything I I was more in tune with being uh talent related booker re related you know running making sure that we filled buildings and 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 that kind of stuff so um but it was it was a a monstrous uh loss for us and there was none of the other promoters that wanted to help be on that. And probably in a, after the next year and Vince got on there and started expanding and expanding. And when Crockett got on uh, uh, Turner and they started expanding, then all the, all the local promoters were put out of business in sense. And, uh, but it changed. It changed everything, and and uh, it is what it is. And uh, just just to clarify, so did you say that Vince actually paid off the entire bill then to get? I, the think, I think that's what I think that's the way it was. He paid the bill, but he got the TV time. Wow, I no idea about that. Quite a while. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you did quite well. I think that show lasted, what, 19 years or 20 years in that slot as well, All-American Wrestling. Uh, I'm going to move on, and I don't know what the story is about this at all. I don't even know the time frame. And uh, this might be one of the saltier questions that may be asked. So here goes. Big Roy, finally, uh, ask about almost severing Terry Funk's ears and Scott Casey's. I have no idea about this story. <laughs> well, we uh, I was wrestling Terry Funk, and uh, we had uh, built a about a 400 seat studio where we did our TV taping for Southwest wrestling. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> so Terry and I were going to do something and then come back in a, uh, in an I quit match. And, uh, and so, and Terry was going to do something, uh, with his ear and uh i said okay i said what what can i what can i use what can i he said i don't know i don't know he said find something so we went to the ring and didn't have any idea what was going to happen or what what i was going to use to to hit him in the ear with and so uh Lo and behold, I rolled out of the ring, and there was the timekeeper's hammer. And so, so I grabbed the hammer and put the the part that you pull a nail out out of the wood. I put that on his ear, <laughs> and, and he he gigged it, and uh, blood came gushing out, and it was. Uh, Quite an angle. <laughs> mm, crikey, yeah, sounds... When I read that, I didn't know if this was an in-ring thing or something that happened in the back. <laughs> oh, no, that was that was in the ring. Where does Scott Casey come into all this then? Well, I, I think we did... Because Casey and Terry... I think Casey came in uh, and beat me up to get me out of there. And so we had a had a... A, a small angle because Terry was just coming in and out. Um, Terry might have stood, he might have just been the world champion uh, at that time. I, I don't remember, but so that I could have somebody local to work with, Scott came in and, and so I think I did something to his ear too. Well, keeping what? the ear theme, keeping the ear theme going. <laughs> it's quite a theme to have, as well as. <laughs> uh, do you know? Because, I somebody remembered it. Yeah. Well, I, as I say, I, I didn't know what to expect as an answer from that, so I'm glad it's sort of quite a fun answer and what it could have been, I guess. Uh, do you know, just because I'm interested, how many times before you went to Crockett did you wrestle the NWA champion coming to Southwest or wherever it was? Um. My career changed when I wrestled, and this is before I switched heel. I wrestled Dory Funk Jr. when he was the world champion. I wrestled him in an hour time limit. And at the 30-minute mark, I was, I was so tired that I couldn't hardly get up off the mat. And there's something about when the world champion is slapping you on top of the head <laughs> saying, get up, kid, get up, kid, get up, kid. And, uh, so I realized at that time that I was not in good enough shape to really be a top professional. And I changed my diet. I changed my exercise. I changed my everything. And, uh, that was the last time that that ever happened to me, that I was too tired to get up and not keep going. So it is, I'm very, very thankful for that. And, uh, but it was a little bit embarrassing when you 
can't do anything and can't lift your arms in the <laughs> ring. Yeah, I don't know who told me, but it wasn't too long ago. But they said Dory Funk Jr. Liquid Valiant. That's how smooth he was. Oh, he was phenomenal. Just phenomenal. We shall move on. Chris Bovis asks, did you ever work with Andre the Giant? Yes. I had a, in fact, it was when I was uh, a heel. I had just switched heel. And uh, <coughs> I was the uh, Southwest TV champ, I think it was. I might have been the Southwest heavyweight champ. And uh, I said, uh, Andre was coming in and I was going to wrestle him. And uh, so I, I said, I said, okay, this is, this is the thing. I said, he's mammoth. He's this blah, 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 blah. I said, if I can last 10 minutes, I get a partner. And so uh, that was the situation. So I had my partner down there on the, on the side, like a manager. And, and uh, I ran from Andre for 10 minutes and he'd snatch me by the tights. He'd snatch me by the hair. He, one time he stepped on my foot as I dove out of the ring and it was, You don't, when a guy 500 pounds steps on your foot, you don't move too much. Uh, and then uh, I got a partner. And so we came in and and went about four more minutes. And then he body slammed me. And then he body slammed my partner on top of me. And then he sat on both of us and pinned us. One, two, three. <laughs> But it was the biggest crowd that we had had for in quite a while, and so that was very beneficial. When when Andre would come into your territory specifically, how much would the houses jump? Um, just him coming in. I don't know that they would really jump that much, but in this situation, it almost doubled. Mm. And, uh, you know, because, I mean, there's only so much you can do. I mean, Andre used to come in and be in battle royals and, and stuff like that because, you know, he, you couldn't have him come in and just beat somebody, beat your star, you know, and if he wasn't wrestling a star, what, what good is it? What did you have to do to earn Andre's respect? Because we, I talked to certain people and some people say, hey, he was great. Other people said we really had to work on him you know, personally to sort of get a rapport going, what did you have to do to earn Andre's respect? Well, he liked my dad and I just treated him with respect all the years. And, uh, and then it was, you know, I never had an issue with him, but if Andre didn't like you, it was not a good, a good place to be. Now, uh, someone with a follow-up question here, Bill Shogun asks, is it true that when you were in the WWF that Andre the Giant was playing cards in the dressing room and you accidentally knocked a bottle of wine that Andre was drinking off the table and breaking it onto the floor? Arn told the story recently on his podcast, apparently. I don't remember ever doing that. Accident? Maybe? I, I, I don't remember ever doing that. Mm. But, I mean, if Arn said it, he probably witnessed it. But what did Andre do when I... I, I wish I knew this was... Uh... This is the entire st this is the entire question basically. I don't know what the follow up is. So Arn, we'll have to get the follow up from you, man. <laughs> uh, just before we get off Andre, everyone loves an Andre drinking story. What is yours? Um Andre could outdrink anybody. Did you try? I mean, it, oh no, <laughs> oh, ah, absolutely not. Uh, the 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 probably the funniest drinking story that that I 
ever had was we were flying out of Chicago somewhere. And back in those days, you could upgrade your ticket for 25 bucks and sit in first class. So I upgraded my ticket and it, we were on an eight o'clock flight somewhere. Uh, and so I am sitting next to Andre at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm tired, been up most of the night. I'm wanting to go to sleep. And he said, you drink with me. I said, Andre, it's eight o'clock in the morning. I, I, I can't. I can't drink at eight o'clock in the morning. And so he's drinking coffee and whatever they had to put into his coffee. And he looked at me and he said, you drink with me. <laughs> so he ordered me a uh, Bloody Mary and two Bloody Marys later. I am. Um, it, it doesn't take a lot of liquor to get you going at eight o'clock in the morning. Mm. And, uh, oh my gosh. And I had, to, instead of going, when we landed, going to the gym and my normal routine, I had to go to bed. It was horrible. I said, oh my gosh. But, but having to drink with Andre at eight o'clock in the morning is probably my, uh, most horrific story <laughs> i uh do you know just to pick up on that is airports time means nothing so you always have to have a drink no matter what time it is that is the law <laughs> apparently here <laughs> and uh secondly i'm flying to new york next week as we record this by the way and uh i think one upgrade to first uh business class was two thousand dollars per person just uh, just as a a difference of price between like you know the late 70s to today it's crazy oh, oh wow I know, I know. I'm still, I'm, I'm probably not going to do that. I think on on reflection, I think that's probably just not money w wisely invested. Uh, <clears throat> going to move on to mid Atlantic now. Look at it by hour. What's that? Look at it by hour, price by hour. I know, I know. <laughs> I just, I can never sleep on planes. That's the thing. So I'm thinking some like small upgrade just for the flight back. You know, when it's like a nighttime flight. But anyway, I'll. I won't bore you to death <laughs> with my flying for the next few months. Uh, we're going to move on to Mid-Atlantic, and as I say, I'm going to be speeding through your career and just trying to pick up some of the highlights. A lot of AEW questions have come in as well, by the way, so we'll get to those as well. Mid-Atlantic, most people uh, asked about this period in your life. Uh, my name is unavailable, asks. Please remind the fans that Tully didn't say, I quit in 1985. He is still the NWA United States champion. Is that true? You never said it? Never said I quit. <laughs> did that? Did how long after that match did you keep saying I never said I quit? I uh, don't know. I don't. I don't remember how long that we we did that because when Magnum went and he started wrestling other people, um, but it was. Uh, but I never said I quit. Mm. I mean, you can go back and look at the footage. There were no tap outs either in those days, were there? So, hmm. Not I quit match. Mm? No, I mean, yeah, I so. you had to say, I quit. What did you say? Or did you say nothing? Yeah. I said, yes. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's a great little get out, isn't it? <laughs> I, shall, I shall move on. Uh, Sean Southall says, what are, uh, what are your thoughts about his I quit match? against a Magnum TA at Starcade 85. I think match quality wise, he would like to know your thoughts. Uh my my quality thoughts, there's a number of things that I thought I did I could have done better. Okay. Um but if you just look at the match, it's one of the greatest matches of all time. And uh I think I think some people have put it as number 2 at the the greatest Starcade matches. Uh, I think, I think somebody told me that, uh, but I'm not for sure, but it was, uh, people screamed the entire time. And, uh, and that's what you want. 
you want people in, in involved in uh, everything that you do, mm-hmm. and they will. Are you just picking up on what you said before? There were several things that you thought you could have done better. Are you someone who's always overly critical of themselves? Probably. I can always be better, <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's part of what drove me uh, all the time. So, what specifically in that match would you like to change if you could? Uh, we'd have to watch it, and I could pinpoint it. I can't. <laughs> Uh, I don't I, have the brain power to say, "Oh, when I was this and that." And that's, that's, we actually, if we had more time, I actually could do that, but we'll uh, we'll have to for a part two. I promise you. Um, someone else also asked, uh, Declar K Vapor has said, <clears throat> uh, "Absolutely loved the match. I'd like to know what the planning process was behind it. How much was planned ahead?" and what was agreed in the back. Now, I think this is almost a misnomer that pretty much anything was agreed at any point beforehand. Um, well, I mean, the only thing that that uh, that I did ever was I knew what the end was going to be, and how we got there was up to me. That's why. That's why the bad guy was really good bad guys were called ring generals. And uh, it was your job to make the baby face look good. And the better he looked and the better everything went. And if you had everybody's confidence that, that you weren't going to go out there and be an idiot and make them look bad, uh, you could accomplish things. And I, have was in that situation most of my career. And uh, the only thing that that uh, I knew was that we were going to uh, do that and everything else. I don't know that I, I don't think that I even uh, did I was did baby doll throw me a hammer? I watched it years ago. I cannot remember. I, 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 if I had time, I would have watched it before we interviewed today, but I, no, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't remember that, but she might have. I'm, I'm going to pick up on something else you said there as well. I, uh, I nearly gave away the question there. Je- Ring generals. So obviously you were in AEW several years until recently. Is there anybody on the AEW roster who would qualify as a ring general to the level that they could have a match, the quality of the I Quit match, with, as you said before, no pre-planning? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, that that's not the way it's done anymore. So, um, you know, there there were some guys that... that uh, FTR were were they're a great tag team. Uh, Sean Spears is a very talented uh, wrestler, but they're they're trained in a way to do things that I that I couldn't function. Uh, and you know, so it's it's not necessarily. Uh, a place where you have a ring general anymore because of the in depth that they, that goes on beforehand. We shall move on uh, back into the eighties. We're, we're going to be sure. flicking back and forth, I know, and I think we've got a game coming up quite soon as well. So, <laughs> Jason Lee, when you guys went back through the curtain after your first blood match with Dusty Rhodes, did both of you have a sense that you would change the game in a significant way? Um, I I don't know that. It, I don't know that you had a thought like that um i know that the game was changing just by the by the abilities of the people that were involved and uh you know the first the first blood match was was just 
uh, awesome. And uh, he did hit me pretty hard with the shoe. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but it was, uh, you know, then, then we, uh, or I hit him with the shoe, didn't I? He hit me with the shoe, then I hit him with the shoe. JJ put Vaseline on my forehead so that the that I'd quit bleeding like a boxer. Oh. <laughs> and uh I think that was the finish, wasn't it? And I think then so. I hit then I hit Dusty with the shoe and he and he bled first. Mm -hmm. I think so. do, do you never ever because as we just established before you're really overcritical but even on that match you must have like rubbed your hands and gone we got him on that one or were you still thinking ah we could have changed this and that I I don't know I, I mean when I I mean there are things that that I would probably change in every match that I've ever been in if it was just a you know just watching it what what should I have done what could I have done what would have been better than what I did. Um, and I'd always have something to say about it like that, but I'd have to be watching spot by spot by spot. Yeah. So, With Dusty's Booker, obviously he's on one side of the fence, he's on the good guy side of the fence, you guys, the four horsemen are on the other side. How vocal were you to Dusty personally about direction and that kind of thing? Or would that be left to J.J. Dillon to sort out? Um, <clears throat> well, it was, there was, we were four of the top guys and, uh, and back in those days we were running three towns a night. So, you know, and, and we didn't have to be in, in the same town every night. Uh, so we could be doing something I had the TV champion for a while, or Arn and I could be somewhere else with the tag team championship. Uh, you know, it, it was, it was not a situation where we had to be overly vocal about it. Um, although Arn and I left over some, we were told certain things that didn't come true. And that's when we reached out to to Vince mm -hmm. to go up there. So with uh we'll be getting to that. Uh, if if time allows, we'll be getting to that. Uh with uh, Dusty, creatively wise, where does he rank as far as the you know, the pantheon of great bookers, where does Dusty sit on that? Ah. Uh... I don't I don't really know because I didn't get to travel and be around a lot of different bookers. The the thing that is <clears throat> it it is sometimes very difficult for the people that were the bookers to be objective with everybody because they were also the stars. And so you kept yourself in that position. Um, the George Scott was, was a great booker in, in the Carolinas. And, but he, but he didn't wrestle. So, I mean, he kept everything, uh, objective. At least I think so. I was hmm. just, my first year in the business, I was uh, not, you know, I was just there, happy to have a job every day and and uh, being taken care of a little bit. I wanted to bring this up as well. Is I don't know if too many people know that Sheep Heard a Luke booked for Southwest at one point, didn't he? Yes, he did. I, I was I was already gone at that time. Oh, so that was in and, the final months, kind of thing. Yes. And uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I was just going to go back. Sorry, I was trying not to cough halfway through that as well. I apologize. Um, 
was Dusty was wrestling Dusty just the easiest thing because the crowd's already with you? Um, no, really. You still ha- you still have to go out and make people scream, and uh, you know you still had to get heat. And you still had to get and do stuff, and uh, but it was. You know, I I did some I did some stuff with Dusty that was that was pretty remarkable that uh, he he didn't do with very many people, um, and uh, that was that was a very very good uh, match, and and we recycled that from buying baby doll for thirty days to to money hanging over the the ring to uh first blood match et cetera et cetera so uh, one more thing about dusty did the elbows uh, hurt the <laughs> did it look like they hurt yes good <laughs> that's the spirit <laughs> now I've got one more question, then we're going to go into our first game. And several people have written this in. I don't know the story about it. I don't know if it's something you want to skip or or address or whatever it is, but here goes. Kevin the Goat has asked, or basically says, ask him about his fights with Manny Fernandez. What's the story? My fight with Manny Fernandez? Yes. Did you have a fight with him, or was it on the same side, or what happened? Ah, uh, well, we were wrestling each other and, and, uh, it was, uh, you know, very, very intense and people loved it. And, uh, uh, sometimes I didn't exactly like to get a black eye or a broken nose or anything like that, but you know, it was, it, it was what it was. Mm. I think uh, I think this may be hinting some some sort of backstage thing, but I don't know. Well, there was an incident that was not backstage, but it was outside. Um, that was that I probably will not go into because it had some legal ramifications. Okay, and. Uh, I am, it's many, many years ago, and uh, it was something that we had to deal with as a company, and uh, we did, and got through it, but it was, it was, uh, at at the moment, it was not the, the best thing for everybody. Mm-hmm. But very diplomatically answered as well. Don't worry, we've got some more fun questions. <laughs> we've got some more fun questions coming up now. So this is the first of... We're not going to get to the second game. There's just too many questions to ask. But I call this name association. Essentially, I'm going to give you a sentence, a description, and you tell me the first name that comes into your head. So it could be from any wrestling personality from any locker room. And the first sentence is the funniest person in the locker room. Baron von Raschke. Right, that's a name that's never come up in the hundred times I've asked this. Why Baron? <laughs> <laughs> Why Baron? Because he was hilarious. Jokes with the way he walked. Yeah, no, just the the things that he said. There you go. Dude. He. <laughs> do, do, do you know, everyone says Brad Armstrong, so it's, it, I'm glad to have a different name in that. Finally, I'll tell you. Uh, this one's going to be the easiest one. Last, Brad Armstrong is funny too. Yeah, <laughs> last man standing at the bar, apart from Andre. I was never in there that late, so I don't know. Do you not just see <laughs> the carnage the next morning and say, "Oh well, he made it." Ah. <laughs> uh, there was that there, there were some some nights, but I usually cut out of there. Fair enough then. Fair enough. We should move on. Smelliest wrestler. Oh gosh. I can't think of his name, but I was just starting and he had a diet of garlic. Oh my god. 
when he started sweating, it was friggin' horrifying. He wasn't he wasn't Nikolai Volkov, was it? Because someone else said something no. about garlic about him. No, no, this was this was an old timer that I wrestled a few times when I was first starting in the Carolinas, and I can't remember who it was. <laughs> but a, a, a garlicky man. Oh God! And, I mean, yeah. Oh, when he started sweating, it was horrifying. <laughs> Mo- <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for reminding you. Uh, most <laughs> uh, most dangerous situation you found yourself in. It was, and I I don't I don't really remember just exactly. It was in Corpus Christi, and. Um, I can't think of the the ring. Uh, I mean the 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 matches, but it was he used to load his his boot, and we had switched him babyface, and this was back before they had railing, metal railing. It was just ropes. Yeah. And the the officers that were supposed to protect you uh, were uh, sometimes maybe fans. And uh, we had uh, we were fighting back up the, the the towards the dressing room. And uh, the fans were almost in a riot situation and uh, was, I, my side got, got sliced and uh, I, I grabbed whatever fan had done that and pulled them back up the, until the police got them. And then we got back to the dressing room, but that that was a pretty, pretty hairy evening that night. Do you? A couple of people, weirdly, in this line of work that I have, that I seem to interview a lot of people who have been stabbed, and <clears throat> a lot of people say that they don't notice it's happened at the time. Was that the same for you, or did you realize what had happened immediately? Um, no, not really. I mean, it, it's fortunately I wasn't. Uh, penetrated it was just a <laughs> a slice mm. and uh but it was um uh you know back in those days you 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 if it got bad enough normally your your path of action was be get in the ring mm. because if you were had a riot situation going on, people had to climb into the ring and you could pick them off coming through the ropes. And that would be the safest place for you. And, uh, but we were already back up the, the, the path a little ways. So. <clears throat> As a uh, Monty Python says, but a flesh wound at least. So it could have been worse, I guess. <laughs> yes, it could. Um, <clears throat> The most uh, reckless or stiff in the ring? Who's the, in fact, we'll stick with stiffest. Who was the stiffest? I don't know because I didn't have to wrestle any of those guys. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you never even got like, a, you know, an enhancement guy just clonk you on one of those kind of things? or? Oh, yeah. But I mean, that those are more accidents than than anything. But there were some, there were some guys, some old timers that were, that were just stiff, mm. and uh, so we. Yeah, next one is most memorable thing that you saw happen on Jim Crockett's airplane. You know what? Well, I sat with the pilots. Really, I sat, I sat on the jump seat with the pilots, <laughs> and the door closed, and I bypassed everything on the back. Of the airplane. <laughs> was, was that a, was that a just a avoid the drama kind of thing, or 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I it was it was a very relaxing time for me. The the view was unbelievable up in the cockpit. Next question is most high strung, edgy or nervous kind of fella. I don't know because you know the the thing that that we we didn't really. Back in back in the day, I mean, you'd go in the dressing room, get what you're doing, uh, and then I'd get in my routine, you know. And my routine every night was uh, I'd watch the first three matches to see if the people were good, bad, and different, what they were buying, what they weren't. <clears throat> Then I'd go to the get ready, and about 25 minutes from before my I went to the ring, I would do um, 100 step-ups or 100 free squats because anybody that has been in athletics, you always have – when you first start a basketball game or a soccer game or a whatever you, you get extremely, when you start running, you get tired and then you kick back into second and third gear. Mm. Well, I wanted to go into the ring in second gear. I didn't, I didn't want to go in the ring and not be uh, stretched and my heart rate going. And so that's what I did. And uh, that really helped my career because then I was, I never went through that period of uh, where you get where you can't breathe and then you have to calm down a little bit before you go back in. Um, so I, I, I don't know anybody that was really high strung that was kind of a long, nothing happened in answer for, for that. But. <laughs> I'll tell you worry. Uh, I, it's okay. I'll move on. I'll move on. Who have the other people said was high strung? Well, maybe Sid or somebody. Well, see, that was kind of like after my career. Savage. I did. Well, when I was with the, the WWF and, and Randy was there, he was always in his own dressing room and very seldom saw him. Uh, so, you know, I never, I never really hung around him enough to really know if he was edgy or not, but I could probably see that. Well, uh, well, I, I know you'll have an answer for this next one. <laughs> Best jobber. Best jobber. Mm hmm. No. Okay. Of, <laughs> of, the, of the enhancement guys. Of the enhancement guys. <laughs> Do you know, in fairness, I, I, uh, Don Morocco, of all people, always used to say, hey, we're all jobbers, which is a great way of looking at it in that sense. But of, of the enhancement guys, uh, the carpenters, uh, who was the best? Brad Armstrong's partner. What? What? Tim Horner? Tim Horner, Brad, and Tim, they were... They were phenomenal talents. They could do anything in the ring. Good answer. And, and I, never, they never really reached uh, a star status. And uh, but they were, they were just really talented guys. Mm. Especially in Brad's case, is is amazing. Uh, the worst abuser of spray tan or baby oil. It might have been the garlic guy. <laughs> so he, well he was a he was a sensation for, for all the all the senses then wasn't he smell oh, God. yeah baby oil was i hated guys that that were that put on baby oil it, it uh guy you couldn't you couldn't grab onto them you couldn't hold them and i don't know that it made them look any better <laughs> greasier at least they made him look uh yeah. best and worst 
WWF road agents? I think they all could probably have good days and bad days. Um, you had to treat them all about the same. Uh, Do you want some Nick names? Bach Nick Bockwinkle's probably because I I'd known him for many, many years. And the rest of the guys I I you know, because I, I had not been to <clears throat> the New York area uh earlier in my career. My dad never went up there. So I mean I didn't know they didn't know me and I didn't know them. So you just took the instructions and went on about your business. Well, would you like me to name some names? Because uh, we've got like some of the uh, George the Animal Steel, Chief J. Strongbow, Rene Goulet, Jack Lanza, Jerry Briscoe. <laughs> yeah. Um, all of those guys were, were, were good guys. I mean, I, I don't know that you could, you could really say best and worst because they were all just taking orders. And, uh, you know, they'd get the the do's and don'ts from uh, a higher power. And uh, then they were just passing, passing it out. And we still, I mean, it wasn't, uh, okay, what, what do you guys, you know, we just tell them what we we're going to do for the finish. Or they told us and how, how we were going to do it. And everything else was left up to us. You know, again, that's not really what it's like now. Best bar in Atlanta. Well, the only bar that I kind of ever went to was at the airport. Oh, really? <laughs> the the well at the, at the airport hotel because we would fly into Atlanta every Friday night, and you'd have a a, a nightcap. And then go to bed because you have to be at TV at ten o'clock in the morning. Mm. And uh, so we we stayed at the at the Renaissance Hotel at the Atlanta Airport, and that's pretty much the only place you had had a chance to go. Some of the younger guys were a little more in, uh, energetic than than me, mm. and uh, but was was Ric Flair never? Good at convincing you to stay out past your bedtime, then. Oh no! Really? No, that was. You know, we were there. Those stories were better heard the next day. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you're most likely right there. I couldn't disagree with you on that. Um, here's one that I've never asked before, and I'd like to get your idea on it, is the most giving opponent that you ever faced. Just the person who would just be overly generous uh, in the ring. Um, well, that that's not, that's not a good question for me. Okay. Because everybody that, that I wrestled, I was in charge. So... <laughs> You know, and and it was the thing is you're not when a baby face isn't beating you up, people aren't screaming. And if it's your job to make people scream, that's mm, that's yeah, that's it, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. I'll 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 save that question for uh, for someone else though. Uh, the <laughs> I, know, I know we I know we talked about Dory earlier. You can say Dory or someone else, but the smoothest wrestler that you ever faced. Other than Dory, maybe Bachwinkle. Should we stick with Nick? <clears throat> yeah, we'll stick I mean, with Dory. Yeah, that was. Uh, now you can't say yourself for this one. Biggest ladies' man. Oh, I, I for sure wasn't the biggest ladies' man. <laughs> Who was then? Uh well, I mean, you got to say Flair. He put the most effort into it. <laughs> With uh, if if there was like a Mount Rushmore of ladies' men, Ric Flair, Tommy Rich, Ricky Morton, Stan Lane, is that a fair foursome there, or would you put someone else in replacing them? 
No, that's pretty. That's pretty strong. That's pretty strong. They were all. They all worked hard at it. Good for them. Good for them. Uh, <clears throat> the worst injury you ever saw or happened to you? When I pulled, when I tore one of my hamstrings, one time. <clears throat> How long did it take you to recover from it? Well, I had to wrestle the next day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever get it fixed? Um, well, I had to just rehab it, but uh, it was it was tough for a couple of days, and How then did... I was then I uh, I was in a car wreck and uh, mashed my leg, and I didn't I didn't uh, wrestle for about five weeks hmm. because of that. How, how did how was the initial injury done? Uh it I, nothing was broken. It just mashed my leg, and uh, it was I couldn't walk. I was on crutches. What about the hamstring? So uh, how how was that injury done? Oh, just in the ring. I just I was running running the ropes or running the turnbuckle or something, and uh, it. Bing. Mm. Then you can't run anymore. And so <laughs> the match all of a sudden got in the middle of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was less mobile affair, I imagine, definitely. Uh, I've only got a couple more left. Uh, worst driver? Worst driver? Yes. Do not know that because I drove all the time. And that is the right answer. Biggest river? That could have been Heenan. Oh yeah. Any examples, or did he get you? Um, no, I tried real hard to to stay weary of all that stuff, and uh, a lot of times you could just be make sure you didn't get out of position, and you could avoid all that stuff, mm. and. Uh, when you were in the WWF, I mean, you were in the uh, and the Nasty Boys weren't there at the time. I know that, but there was Kurt Hennig, Mister Fuji, Bobby Heen, and so did you have to be on your guard all times then? Um, you you did if you if you were in the bar with everybody or whatever, and um, so it was. Uh, But you weren't in the bar late anyway, so. Well, I mean, I was in the bar late sometimes, but I, I, I didn't necessarily want to be hanging out with the boys. Mm. How come? <clears throat> Just you spend enough time with them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you 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 can only hear the, the same story over and over. No. Fair enough then. Uh, I've got two more in this game, then we shall move on. The most, <laughs> uh, once again, you cannot say yourself, the most legitimate tough badass. Well, Rashki was tough. Wahoo was tough. Brody was tough. Very good ones. Any more? Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll move on to the uh, last question here. Uh, most memorable backstage fights doesn't it doesn't involve you in any way. You're just a passive participant, uh, uh, passive witness. I don't know that I ever really saw one. Really, backstage. Well, there you go. Then I thought I thought there'd be I did I don't know. I imagine there'd be tussles all the time, but just no. No, nah, that 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 <clears throat> the guys from my era, for the most part, were not the egomaniacs because they they knew how it it all came shape and you know so you not a bunch of egos got stepped on. Mm. There you go. Right, we are going to move on then, and to more fan questions. F Deadly Commissar asks: Does 
Uh, he's still keeping in contact with Ole Anderson. What is his opinion on Ole as a wrestler, a booker, and a human being? Um, Ole is, was a, now you want to talk about somebody that was stiff, Ole was stiff. <laughs> <clears throat> and I had to wrestle him a few times, so I, I know that. Um, he was, uh, he was a good booker during a period of time. Um, outside the ring, I did, I really don't, didn't know him. Uh, you know, I only knew him in the dressing room and in a professional sense. And, uh, I, I know that it's uh, he's still he's pretty his body's pretty beat up and uh, uh, life has not been real good to him. So, do you still see him, or did he still used to make the conventions at one time, and does he still make them occasionally? I I don't think he has made one in about four or five years. I think the last time I remember seeing him, we were in in uh, Central Georgia signing autographs. And uh, yeah, I, I think he was in a wheelchair. Is he been? In, yeah, he's been in a wheelchair for a while. I think hasn't he? Yes. <clears throat> we should move on. Mark Williamson about Tully and Arn's feud with the Midnight Express in 1988. Sorry, this is jumping about a bit again. I know, I understand. Does he know what the program was leading to storyline wise? So uh, I believe this was just before you left the uh, NWA, wasn't it? And you were in a feud with the Midnight Express's Bad Guys versus Bad Guys, wasn't it? Well, we wrestled them one one time and and gave them the the championship belts, and then Arn and I left and went to New York. <clears throat> so it was a one-night feud. You were talking about each other for quite a lot, though. Or at least, you know, JJ and Jim Cornette were uh, on TV for yeah. quite a few weeks. Yeah. It, they were uh, they were a fabulous tag team, and they, they were like... Uh, smooth as glass and we probably could have made it believable i don't know if the fans would have ever really bought big tickets to be uh to watch a heel match but um the situations uh had deteriorated in the in the uh, negotiations for whatever, and Arn and I decided that it was time to go. Mm. It seems a shame that one match, and it was probably like a six-week thing on TV building up to <clears throat> essentially what would end up not go uh, any further, which is a shame. W with that being said, if with that match that you had with the Midnights, and further on down the line, if it got that far, who would have been the good guys, do you think? No idea. It would have been, uh, you'd have just had to see the way it was going. And, uh, you know, the, the the main goal still is to make people scream. Hmm. And, uh, you know, you you going to make them scream or you're not going to make them scream. And uh, both, all four men, their job was to make people scream and did it very, very well. And uh, uh, Cornette and JJ were certainly on board. So it would have been interesting. Who would you have preferred? Would you have, would you have preferred to stay in the role that you were in? Could you ever see yourself getting cheered? No. I, I mean, it, it was – I was – Arn and Rick and Barry were all – lean toward the baby face thing. I was the one that really kind of kept the heel mantra for the horseman. Uh, you know, Flair, everybody wanted to like Flair. So, uh, Before we get off this, everybody loves a Jim Cornette story or 10. Uh, have you got a Jim Cornette story? Um, he was fun to watch. 
did you uh, did he ever make any overtures towards you when he had Smoky Mountain wrestling to sort of bring you in? No. Would you have? This was, would have been like ninety two, ninety three era, let's say. No, I was I was done. I, I did, I did. Uh, I think I did five or six or seven matches in the early nineties. Um, uh, but I was I was done. Now. Some of the four horsemen questions that I know everybody's desperate to hear about. Uh, and I haven't got my glasses on, so if I'm really struggling with some of these names, it's unfamiliar names and they're all blurry as well. Uh, C. Reed and Here asks, what was your favourite incarnation of the four horsemen? And when was it? And uh, also, what was your favourite incarnation of the four horsemen when you were not in the group as well? So, the, originally when you were within the group. Um... Well, the original were good because we're the ones that started it. Um, the best group was the group that went in the Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, Rick, Barry, Arn, and myself, and JJ. Um, after that, you know, it was putting people trying to rebirth something. And, uh, and I, I didn't watch wrestling, so I didn't, I don't really know who, what, where, mm-hmm. any of that. So. Why didn't Lex work out as a member of the Four Horsemen then, do you think? Well, at that point in Lex's career, he was very young in the business, looked great. But the horsemen were about doing the right things, not just looking right. And uh, it was it was it was a much better fix when we switched Barry heel and Lex babyface, and then we wrestled him. I know I had to wrestle him a number of times, and those were way better matches than than other ones that I was involved in. Mm. Uh, do you know, that reminds me, Dutch, <clears throat> when he was in, Dutch Mantel, by uh, everybody, weekly podcast with him, of course, I've got to bring him up. He said <clears throat> once that uh, him and Bobby Jaggers were facing you and Lex Luger at one point, and apparently Lex went to the office or something like that and said, why would a Lex Luger wrestle a Dutch Mantel? And Dutch caught wind of it, and he was like, Oof. He, he, uh, he heard that apparently. Wow. I I never heard that. Yeah. But and then your response was Lex, you just stay on the apron, I'll show you how a professional does it. And then you and Dutch and Jaggers just wrestled ten minutes and then Lex just stood on the apron for the entire match. I I can see me doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad you didn't know this. I'm glad I could tell you a story then. But yeah, so Dutch has said that one to me a couple of times. Uh, <clears throat> we'll move on. Mark Williamson, do you know anything about a rumoured storyline whereby you and the other horsemen eventually turn on Flair and what such a scenario might have looked like? So was that ever on the cards? No, not that I know of. But I wasn't involved in those brainstorming things and I, I never heard of that storyline. Would J.J. Dillon be filtering information from the booking office to you at this time, just so you knew where you were going in the next few months? Um, I mean, th- there wasn't really any filtering to do because, I mean, <clears throat> we were figured in and we were involved and in everything. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a secret. And uh, it wasn't... It wasn't bad, and it wasn't a secret. How many horseman reunions have you done, like, on the conventions and stuff? <clears throat> um, I don't know, maybe six, seven, eight, something like that over the years. <clears throat> I, know that, I know that it is um, the last one that we did was uh, in Nashville a couple of years ago. 
maybe last, maybe it was last summer, a year ago, hmm. summer. Do you think AEW is going to bring one on? Because now they've signed Ric Flair and his energy drink to a two-year deal. So, And then apparently oh. Arn's just left now as well. So it never seems to quite... A, a four-horseman reunion on the big screen, essentially. Do you think that'll ever happen? Uh, I don't think so. No? No. I mean, the, the, they finished with me a year ago. And uh, to bring me back doesn't mean anything. And uh, Arn, you know, I mean, they might... Tony may want to bring back a different version of the Horsemen, but if you don't bring back the ones that are in the Hall of Fame with Rick, it diminishes to some degree. But anyway. Uh, I'll get to Rick on a, in a second uh, again. Do you think Ole should have been in the Hall of Fame with you guys with the four Horsemen? Um... That wasn't our choice. By any means, I was very surprised when uh, I got the call from the WWE uh, for them to do it. Uh, it was, uh, Ole was certainly there at the beginning of it because of him and Arn being the tag team. Uh, I don't know that the best group of us was the group that did go into the Hall of Fame because we could we only you had to wrestle only style Arn Barry and myself and Rick we could adapt to anybody so that made us uh way more flexible talent wise mm. now I before we started recording was watching your very last match and it was a six-man tag team match, Tully and the FTR versus Jungle Boy, Marco Stunt, and who's the third guy? Luchasaurus. And I was thinking, and I looked up your age at the time, you were 67, I was thinking, crikey, you're moving well for 67. And especially because I just watched Ric Flair's last match as well, and he's only a few years older. And I was thinking, man, we should have got you involved in the last match. <laughs> I had to, I had to be at work on Sunday morning, so I had to fly back. Did you? Oh, really? Yes. <clears throat> what did you think of Ric Flair's last match? I didn't see it. Fair enough, then. Uh, what do you think of your last <laughs> match? <laughs> <laughs> you, you you have probably heard enough about it. Anyway, uh, what do you think of your last match then? Because I know you did you know you did a few things here and there. You even did the slingshot suplex on. Marco stunt the little fella. How was that experience? It was probably the best slingshot suplex I ever did. Uh, yeah, but he weighed like eighty pounds. How could it not be? <laughs> it was it was textbook. It was <laughs> <laughs> the uh, my favorite part of the whole match is when I when I went to dive through the ropes and then stopped. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Right. <laughs> I mean, that must was that the first time that you've ever been with five other people in a match and they're all planning out everything? And then, I mean, how did you cope with that, essentially? Well, I let them do what they do, and I did what I did. <laughs> how did your body feel the next day? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, a uh, little banged up because you you certainly, at any age, the first time you got back in the ring, just hitting the ropes hurt and uh, taking a, a bump hurt. And so. Would you do another? If, no. Uh, no. If the money was too no. hard to turn out, no? No. Would you, for any reason, take a bump again? No. <laughs> so that was your last bump ever. Then that's that's that boxed off. Um, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I I want to be able to play golf when I'm eighty and ninety. I have a dear friend that's ninety two that still uh, plays good golf and fun to be around, and I want to be that guy at ninety two. Uh, and I uh, I am. Um, 
trying that and to go out there and take a bump for whatever amount of money and hurt your hip or hurt my knee. I watched my dad in his fifties where he couldn't go do anything uh, because his body was so beat up from 30 years in the ring. Uh, I never wanted to be that guy. What's your handicap in golf? Rather than uh, physically? I, I used to be reasonable. I have picked up some bad habits and I, and I don't really know. I, I might've been just the simple fact that, uh, and I, and I've really been analyzing this, but the, when I was with AEW, I was doing a lot of spike pile drivers, mm -hmm. jumping off the ring onto the floor, jumping off the top rope onto the ring. And I've, I've really got some hip issues on my left hip. And, uh, when you finish your golf swing, when you're right-handed, you got to finish on your left leg, which torques your hip a little bit. And I don't know if, if that is causing my issues, uh, or if it's just the fact that my, my golf brain is, is got lazy, but, uh, I, I can I can shoot. The last time I played last week, I shot nine holes, and I shot uh, forty-seven. So that's not really good. Uh, I was down in the in the mid to low eighties, which would be forty twos, forty threes. But uh, I am determined to get back down there, and. Uh, there are great golf courses in England. I need to come over and do a a, a personal appearance with you. Yeah, I uh, well, I'm joining the one down the road for me next year because I I tore my ACL about nearly 18 months ago now. I've not played since, but I just I'd never got the time to play enough to get good at it. So my handicap was always around 18, 19, 20, something like that. But yeah, yeah, next year. So close. Yeah, next yeah, fair enough then. We don't have to give each other any consideration and then, you know, a beer on it closest to the pin. It's got to uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Just, man, I miss golf so much. I'm sorry, I could talk about golf for two hours, everybody. I, I just some, sometimes I, I anyway, no one else would be interested apart from us, I'm sure. But I'm gonna ask a couple more questions about uh, WWF, then I'm gonna do some AW questions and then that will be our time and I will thank you very much indeed. So ultimately, <coughs> in your opinion, why did Jim Crockett start to falter? And uh, see, because in my mind, JCP somehow they were millions in debt by like '88. Even though they're filling arenas, TV ratings are doing great for the most part. So, what went wrong for Jim Crockett Promotions then? Well, I don't really know. But things seem to un unravel a little bit when they bought two airplanes and four full-time pilots and gave out big guaranteed contracts and it is sometimes maybe your focus gets a little bit off you forget what what got you where you were where you were um and i and i wasn't really there that much of the time and then went to went to the wwf soon to be wwe uh, and that was a uh That was a very enlightening time of my life. And uh Are you just talking so, about how the two companies were run? Yes. Paying the two. What was the difference? Um <clears throat> the
this is just amongst the the talent. It was everybody. Everybody went to the ring trying to do the best that they could. And if somebody before you had a great match, then you had to go out and perform harder. And sometimes you could, sometimes you couldn't have a better match. Um, and that made the product better. And that was oftentimes not what was uh, the priority in the other company. And uh, you go out and have a really good match. And, and if you were on the wrong spot on the card and made somebody mad because they had to go out and do things differently or couldn't do things differently to have a better match, then people would gripe about it and things would uh, ripple down. So it was a little bit of a, a shock to uh, my world, hmm. my personal world. What was your reaction when you found out that Ted Turner was buying Crockett out? <clears throat> so, uh, you were in the WWF at the time. I I, I know that, but uh, well, yeah, yeah. When you heard that Ted Turner was basically buying into the wrestling business, um, well, I knew that they'd be paying some big money because he only knew how to play pay baseball players and and basketball players, and uh, so that was what happened, and. Uh, when they offered Arn and I big money to come back and reform the Four Horsemen, that certainly was good for us. But it was, but Vince wasn't going to let that happen. Hmm. So, anyway, yeah. I'm going to write a book about that. Oh, you're teasing me now. You're teasing. So there's a lot <laughs> to this story then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll leave, I hate to say I'm going to leave that that bit there because just time constraints, but I really want to know more about that. Uh, so we're going to just very briefly touch on the WWF. Uh, you've hinted at it beforehand, but if I can wrap it up succinctly, was it essentially creative differences and not enjoying yourselves, you and Arn, as to why you went to the WWF? Um. Yeah, but the the... We, we were, we were a very good piece to their overall business design because you had the A town, B town, C town, and Arn and I, along with uh, Demolition and some other guys, became the C town main events. But the sea towns went like increased by one hundred and fifty percent. So the home office loved it, but for Arn and I, our pay stayed. We didn't get it. We didn't get an increase in pay to be the C team main event. than we were getting paid working for the other company. Did you ever can did you ever ask to go on the B or A towns to <clears throat> compensate for that? I didn't I didn't uh no because we wouldn't have been the main event. We wouldn't have been uh in that situation because Andre was in one town and Hogan was in the other town. And uh that's kind of the way things floated. <clears throat> so, when you go over, who makes the first overture? Is it to is it you and Arn to WWF, or is it the WWF to you to bring you over? Um, they reached out to us. 
uh, Pat Patterson came to one of our shows and, and uh, I saw him outside the dressing room and he said, if you guys ever want to make a move, call me. Right. So it's just and as he, simple as that then. So just one phone call and you're out. It wasn't a phone call. It was a, he handed me a, oh, right. a, a thing, a little pad with his number on it. Mm. <clears throat> did you have so, a, did you have a sit down meeting with Vince, or were you just added to the cards? No, we had a sit down meeting with Vince before we before we actually went up there. What kind of guarantees would he give you, or at least promises? Well, that we that we would be pushed. It was never a, a financial. You're going to make this much money. That that was not the situation, but. Uh, did, it was. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Did he make mention of uh, merchandise and royalties and figures and that kind of thing to you? All of that stuff was was taken care of the, with other people down the. I mean, I still I still get a check, royalty check. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got a Legends deal? I think I think my my my. Uh, Last check was like thirty eight dollars. <laughs> so rolling high then. It's it, it, funny. Uh, I keep mentioning this, but Dutch brought out his check recently, and I think it was under a dollar. Ah, so <clears throat> you know the royalties. Uh, so with the sit down meeting with Vince, essentially, does he say anything about you are going to get to run with the belts, or that you're going to have Bobby Heenan as your manager? I mean, were there any promises like that made to you? Um, yeah, Bobby was going to be our manager. And, uh, uh, so that was, that was good, but, you know, getting the belts or anything like that, that at that time was not really, uh, discussed with us. Did your pay increase when you got the belts or was it, did it just plateau during your entire run? No, when we were the champions or wrestling for the thing, it, it didn't make any difference. Yeah. We will, oh, gold, trying to get this one page out. There we go, it's stuck together. Right, so in our remaining time of whatever it is, 20 or less minutes, whenever Chris comes and grabs you, I'm going to ask you some AW questions. If we get through those, I've always got some backup ones as well. So <laughs> don't you worry about that. Don't you worry about that. Uh, yeah, we got, we got 44 minutes before I have to be on the convention floor. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to let you go in 19 or less. So just whenever Chris gives you the hook. So I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll determine it to him. Uh, AEW, first time meeting Tony Khan and the first time you heard about the concept of uh, a promotion to go against Vince for the first time in quite a long time. Uh, the first time that I met him was uh, a match. I just went up for a pay-per-view, one of their first pay-per-views. Um, and then I was asked to come and manage... Uh, Sean Spears at a uh, at another pay per view, and coming to work for them other than just doing a spot uh, was not a dis not ever a discussion, and uh, it was. Uh, most of my conversations uh, were not done with Tony, um, uh, which is so. I I really spent very little time talking to Tony. When and, uh, when did you sign your first contract then with the company? How many months after your first appearance? Uh, oh, maybe a year or so. Oh, really? Yeah, because that first pay-per-view was all by itself. And uh, then the second one was having me come out with uh, uh, Sean against Cody Rhodes. And uh, then they had Arn come out at the end of the match and, and – uh, belly to belly uh sean on the ramp and uh 
and then that was done. And then I came back a few months later as Sean's manager rather than just being a sidekick for one, one thing. Now, I'd never be as impertinent uh, as to ask you how much Tony paid you, but did Tony pay you well for the contract? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Yes. Not great, but I mean, it was well. What's uh, without giving away too many numbers or anything like that? What's what's great in your estimation? Well, I mean, there's there's guys that are making ten, fifteen thousand a week, and I certainly wasn't in that category. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Then I mean, yep. Yeah. Uh, we will uh, move on to a fan question. Actually, so uh, Dean's asks generally, what are your thoughts about managing Pinnacle slash FTR in AEW? I enjoyed your limited screen time, but was underwhelmed, especially with the abrupt end to managing FTR. So apparently, just how can we just cut off so abruptly then? Yeah. And I wasn't there anymore. Why? Obviously, somebody didn't like what I was doing. With or lack of what I was doing. FTR as a team, uh, you mentioned them before, very, very good team. Obviously, teams these days and teams back in the day, they operate completely differently as how they put a match together, but FTR as a, a team and as people. Uh, they are probably the best tag team right now. Uh, I would have a hard time saying best tag team of all time since... Arn and I are already in that position. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> what, but, made, uh, what made them better than, uh, what makes them the best today, in your opinion? What puts them on top? Uh, they work very well together and uh, do a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in the ring. And, uh, you know, it... Uh, I didn't I didn't get asked a lot uh and so it was it was very very um it was very hard for me to flow even outside the ring because I was I'm more of a spontaneous type guy rather than okay be here at this time be here at this time that that kind of stuff, and I, I at my age, I just I don't remember all that stuff. <laughs> uh, especially because, especially with your last match as well, it was in the lockdown era as well, with no fans apart from like a few of the, a few of the like yeah. employees as well. So I mean, that must can't have been the easiest thing. But I was thinking, you know, you started in the mid seventies, and then your last match was in the lockdown era. So how how fant what a fantastic career that is. <laughs> I shall uh, give you some more questions reality or fiction what's your opinion on Brian Cage he was the top star in Impact but once he went to AEW he seemed to flounder for a long time was it you who requested to be with Cage before you left um no they they asked me to be there and do that mm -hmm. uh, Brian has got great potential uh and but, again, you've got to do the right stuff at the right time. Uh, weed that out for me slightly. So uh, where does Brian lack slightly in not doing things at the right time then? Um, this is probably not the, the setting to do that, but it is uh, – he and I talked, and uh, the advice that I gave him was – you need to be a killer. I said, you look like a killer. You need to be a killer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, who would come to you for advice in the roster? Nobody. You're joking. Would any of the young guys go to any of the veterans for advice for any reason? As far as I know, Arn or myself, nobody ever came to us. <laughs> Kidding. I, I find that impossible no. to believe. Or maybe I don't, but... 
so what what is it with today's generation that they don't want to get get advice Chris and I had this discussion yesterday and it's about the same thing just mm. oh well well Shane <laughs> Douglas and I had this discussion last night if no one's asking you for advice, but you're going to give advice to, let's say, Tony Khan himself, what would be the biggest advice you could give Tony now? I it, It's hard for me to do that because I don't watch the product. <clears throat> but the last time that I saw it, um, you need to be... It needs to be a different product than your competition. You can't be a – you can't be the same product. What are the advice to the wrestlers you would give? If Apparently, they don't want it, but let's say they do want it. What would be the one biggest piece of advice you could give them now? I don't know that I would – if they – I don't know that I my, – my mind and, and from the world that I came from in this business, I don't know – if there's anything that I could offer because I, I don't know how to do what they do mm. because it is, it is a, okay, I'm going to do this and the fans have to cheer for it or boo it or be quiet. And then, but the match never changes. Whereas if I did something and the fans didn't react, I changed course right then, but I had that ability hmm. because my job was to make people scream. So it was lack of spontaneity, lack of spontaneity, if I can say that. Yeah, I, I don't know that they they really know how to do that anymore. Uh, next question is, Na Des, Desportiva has asked, uh, being a tag team specialist, what do you think of the young books? The Young Bucks are very talented, and they would probably rival FTR. Um, and I think they've had a feud or maybe. I, again, I don't watch the product, so I don't. Uh, next one is, do you know why Cody Rhodes left AEW uh, some 18 months Not ago? Good. But it probably he probably got a big raise, but I don't know. <laughs> I can't imagine he didn't get a big raise then. But no, I, apparently it's one big mystery why Cody will will never talk about it publicly, and we all want to know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Do you, do you know why Arn left AEW recently? No. Next one is uh, from a fan. Oh god, my glasses. Epsilona Sama. Anyway, uh, please ask how it was backstage in AEW, and please ask about CM Punk, the Elite, and any stories about the whole CM Punk load of fun backstage thing. Uh, I wasn't there when that happened, and uh, I usually sat in a trailer and watched it on the monitor. I didn't really get involved with uh, the other talent. So. Uh, did you ever speak to Sam Punk? Because he strikes me one of the few people who would actually respect the veterans. Yes. Uh, we chatted, but they they have so many star dressing rooms and stuff that you don't ever get to see those guys unless they come out. And, uh, but, but CM was, was a uh, uh, very respectful and, and uh, he's a very talented guy. And um, is that a problem these days with so many disparate dressing rooms? I mean, it's it's it's, 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 it's almost like people because uh, this is something I hear a lot is that the business is missing these days, the car trips from town to town because that's where you really learn. Um. I don't know. I mean, our the business boomed when we were flying on jets every every day, and not car trips. It was 
the car trips were much harder. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, and you were driving every time as well. Oh, I, I hated driving with somebody else. Uh, one more with AEW. I'm going to finish on one other question, not AEW related. Then I will thank you for your time. Uh, who would be giving you instructions in AEW of what to do that night? So essentially, who was writing the creative and and uh, who will be the sort of liaison as well? I think most of the stuff that I that I did, I was I got instructions from one of the referees. Oh, really? Yeah, and. Uh, what did because that was, I'm sorry I, I was I wasn't really figured in so uh, oh uh, just one quick follow up is Kenny um, what does Kenny Omega do as a executive vice president as well as the Young Bucks uh, I guess they help Tony I don't know no one seems to know that's the weirdest thing <laughs> no one seems to quite know what they do <laughs> uh, I, I will give you this final question. Not related to AEW, but this is maybe the one that was most asked. Dutch Mantel has told me the story. And Ricky Morton himself has told me the story. But there was a time when you were on the 700 Club. Now, I, we don't get like religious channels really here. So uh, 700 Club is, is what exactly? It's, it is a uh, Christian uh, talk, talk show. So is is this something where basically you were uh, basically saying you were born again, or uh, what was the reason for you being sort of on the first for the first time, so sort of like affirming your faith? Uh, yeah, because I had I had just came to know the Lord as my uh, my Savior, and I I talked I was invited to be on the Seven Hundred Club, like in in uh, nineteen ninety or nineteen ninety one in there so uh, with me mentioning ricky morton and the 700 club do you know where i'm going with this story no okay so ricky and dutch have both said but let's just focus on ricky because he said it himself on the story when you were talking about going on the 700 club and you were talking about all the things and all the excesses of the 80s and <clears throat> ricky laughs about it now just so just so we're aware and you said, man, you know, I was, you know, partying too hard with drugs. And, you know, I was telling a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the wrestlers not to mess with the women, especially Ricky Morton. And Ricky was watching with his wife. Uh, Ricky, uh, yeah, so uh, the way Ricky says it is he looked at his wife, his wife looked at him, and then Ricky rolled on the floor. His wife gave him the big elbow drop, pinned him one, two, three, loser, leave town. So, uh, yes, so that was the story, apparently. So, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I've sort of just told it all to you now. I thought you might know it. No, that's the first I've heard about it. Oh, well, there you go, then. Uh, so, there's so your reaction to that story. Well, I certainly would never want to cause anybody personal grief by saying something, because I'm not a storyteller and uh so my apologies uh for that i have seen ricky many times after that so as he says as i say as well he says it's a funny story <laughs> so you know I, I don't need like feeling terrible about it or anything like that but having said that uh, I'm 30, 35 years ago when yeah I, when i met first so on that or 34 years ago what why well, what what was the thing that sort of kicked off that thought process then of turning to religion um it was uh it was a situation where i had flunked a drug test with the wwe and uh they had sent me home uh and i had Arn and I had negotiated uh, a big contract with Ted Turner's people and $250,000 a year for three years, each of us. And uh, on November the 
13th at one o'clock in the morning, Flair called me and told me that they had found out about the drug test and they reneged on the deal. So I was uh, now unemployed. WWE had suspended me and and uh, WCW has reneged on the deal. And at 35 years old, there I was unemployed. And uh, I laid in my bed for three hours and literally I was, I was petrified. What are you going to freaking do to make the amount of money that I need to make? You can't just go out and go work at, at a McDonald's. And uh, so at 4.03 in the morning, I said, Jesus, take over my life. And he did. It was the first time I'd ever said the name Jesus when I wasn't cussing somebody because Jesus' name came out of my mouth a lot, but never in the proper way. And there was a calmness that came over me that I had never felt before. I fell asleep. I woke up the next day. Uh, really didn't notice anything. I mean, I didn't think anything had dramatically happened to me. But the following day, my dad called me on the telephone. And he said, he asked me, he said, what's happened to you? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you don't sound the same. And I said, what do you mean I don't sound the same? He said, you're not cussing. And I went, wow, I'm not. And I wasn't thinking about not cussing because my norm was you had to get an F-bomb out every fifth word just to be speaking English. And uh, and that was now 34 years ago on November 13th. And uh, I have walked a different direction. And God has uh, put me through some hard spots and some good spots. And uh, that's what I do. I, I spend my, since 1994, most of my time has been spent going in and out of prisons and jails in the United States, hoping that somebody would listen and uh, allow God to touch their heart and change their life. You're more happy, more content now than you were in the 80s, 70s? Oh, do I look more content? You look as relaxed yeah, as anything, yeah, I've yeah, got to say. <laughs> 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 listen i'm gonna thank you so much for your time uh i'll shut the podcast down we're pretty much exactly on the hour as well so perfect time as well uh is there any plugs anything you want to get out uh before we shut down wrap up i am great it's a thrill to be able to be on your podcast and uh hopefully you'll have enough questions that we can do this again are you joking have you seen the amount look 10 pages worth we've got to about three <laughs> I'm seriously, we've got an encyclopedia's worth. But uh, once again, thank you so much for uh, Tully for being with us. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you again whenever the next one's released. Thank you, James. Thank you very much.